Uh, we are especially happy to having this opportunity to organize a SUPSI, the University of Applied Sciences of Southern Switzerland, in collaboration with Ernst von Kimakovic, it's the, the, the president of the uh, Humanitarian Management Network. It's a, a, a network um, having 15 plus uh, chapters across the, the globe. So uh, Ernst, uh, along with another number of experts, has been uh, devoting his time and efforts over these years to place uh, among man managers the, the, the importance of thinking um, by, by acknowledging the importance of these uh, humanitarian and humanistic uh, principles to, to, to management. So very, very glad for, for that. Uh, we are also collaborating today with uh, the Jagiellonian University and there is also present a company which is theirs, which is the company where Mikel Castelvi, which is our, um, the person with whom we are going to be talking today, uh, works in. So uh, I thanks all for this uh, organization, for, for your time, Ernst, for your time, and Mikel, for being with us, for uh, Ayrton Prato, for, um, for these songs, which are going to be a uh, continue at the end of this conversation. Uh, so the, um, the way we are going to proceed, it's, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, Mikel, after this brief introduction, uh, Ernst is going to conduct the dialogue with, uh, with Mikel. And this dialogue, this conversation will last at least 45 minutes, after which I will start in moderating a QA uh, session where you can ask as many things as you wish uh, to, the, to, to Mikel. And then after that, after uh, having this uh, session round, of uh, questions and answers, we will be closing the, the event with, with more music. So, um, Estelle Castelvi is based in, in Spain, in Catalonia. He's an engineer. Uh, so, you don't have to have a, a humanistic type of background. So, you can also be an engineer <laughs> and uh, deliver this type of, or, or acknowledge the importance of applying these uh, <clears throat> humanistic uh, principles. Uh, he's been very active uh, over the last decades in several sectors. Now he works in a multinational, it's Derns, uh, which is a company uh, founded in, in 1928, so it's a long-standing company, more than 90 years experience in technical infrastructure for buildings and facilities in urban and industrial areas. Um, he's working in, in Spain in the, in the branch in, in Catalonia, uh, and he has some liberty, some freedom to uh, develop a certain leadership style who's trying to uh, avoid this hierarchical vertical uh, organization, which is typical in many, in many organizations. And he is experiencing over the last three years new methods, new ways of um, engaging and, and, and uh, people and making this a uh, humanistic approach uh, alive. So without Anything else to say from my side, I will hand over to Ernst for starting this conversation with Mikel. And again, thank you very much to, uh, to everybody connecting from different countries in the world. Thanks a lot. So Ernst, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for this kind introduction. And uh, welcome also from my side to everyone. Um, and uh, I am so happy to, to have, uh, first of all, uh, Mikel here, of course, but also all the rest of you. Um, uh, we are, as, as Ivan said, we are spread around the globe. We have a few first-time uh, countries participating in this e event of ours, uh, from all the way from Mongolia, for example. Uh, Philippines, we haven't had participants so far, I think, in, in our online events, and, uh, and many more. So very warm welcome also from me to all of you. And uh, thank you, Ivan, for your collaboration with us on, on this uh, um, Leadership Gold event. Uh, of which there will be more. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the second one in the series and we will continue uh, with probably one more uh, later in this year. Uh, but before I start talking too much about things that are not really the important part for today, I want to get going straight away with, uh, with Mikel. Uh, Mikel, such a pleasure to have you here and such a coincidence that we met a few uh, months ago in Barcelona 
um, our, our name is Humanistic Management Network, right? And the network here really worked because our Colombia chapter lead, Carlos Largacha, was in Barcelona at the time. Uh, and so I went there and basically to meet up with him. And he, he said, listen, I'm meeting up with someone else I know from Bilbao, from the north of Spain. She's coming to Barcelona and we're visiting some businesses. Why don't you come along? And uh, one of those businesses uh, we visited was uh, Dan's Spain office. And uh, with that, I, I met Mikel. And uh, I was deeply impressed by the openness with which he shared uh, his story and uh, the way they are uh, managing the organization. And uh, so it, it took me, I think, three or four minutes into your conversation that I said, like, can I please get you on a, on a live uh, event that we're having uh, from the humanistic management? And thank you very much, Mikel, for, for saying yes. Um, Mikel, I, I said I was impressed by your story. What is your story? Thank you, Ernst. Thank you, Ivan. Um, pleasure to be with you. and and share this conversation. Um, my story, the story I told you when we met uh, that day in Barcelona uh, is basically a story of, of um, learning from different uh, ways of leading companies, especially related with engineering and construction, also in, in railway sector. And maybe um, just uh, to make it not too long, uh, I started with also working for, for multinationals and um, the, the, the first years of my career, I worked in, in really um, very um, hierarchical and driven by, I would say, some interests of, of maybe the shareholders that were at the same time, sometimes the, the managing directors um, that uh, even though the, the, the companies were um, having a product and a team that was um, very uh, interesting for the market and successful, sometimes uh, we had to see how some fights within some, uh, actually they were in some cases where we win the owners made things don't go that well. Um, and so my, my story is about um, how, how do I understand leadership? And, and that's why I thought, uh, I mean, your approach is actually very, um, so very, very familiar to me or resonates with, with loads of learnings. Um, my story also is about uh, the, the progress in one specific company uh, that I joined uh, 22 years ago. And actually, uh, I, I was with, with um, working for a boss that uh, even though he was extremely good at selling, he was not as good at, at managing staff. And we had loads of fights and, and some, sometimes we, we entered onto a position that we said it's better not to continue together. Uh, but uh, he, he, on a way, he saw that there was some value on keeping me there. And step by step, we, we got on. I, I got more shares from that company with time. Uh, that was the way um, he could convince me to stay, have to um, recognize it. And, and there was a moment that uh, we were in the deep, deep financial crisis uh, that in Spain um, was extremely hard. I'm talking about uh, what started in, in 2008, but in Spain it lasted till uh, 2013, 2014, depending on and well, some years were worse than others, but it was a, like a long recession. And at a certain moment, I, I became the, um, what we call in Spanish is the administrador. It is the, the final, the end responsible of, of the company. And, and at that moment, we, 
we faced um, a crisis that I was not really uh, aware of. Um, the truth is that I was dealing with projects, but not really dealing with the managing of the company. So this is something that um, I, I, I took this role as a consequence of the situation, but not because I wanted. And I was also uh, looking at it from, from distance now. I was not prepared. So we faced um, a, a situation uh, that was a, a, and the need of, of going to bankruptcy because we uh, were not capable to, to pay our duties uh, without uh, getting more debt. And, and that uh, was a process that was um, going uh, nowhere in a way because we had a too large structure and um, we, we the, well, the, 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 the way the situation went and the, the, the market, uh, how things were going, we were not capable to, to go further. So um, I was a technical guy, an engineer that became a, a director of a company um, with not all the preparation, but it was more due to some also arguments and, and the, uh, the will to continue with the work I like, but I went as a director and as a major shareholder onto a bankruptcy process. Uh, that was um, completely new for me, and it was um, um, a challenge to, to, uh, to afford it. Um, and today, what I can say is that um, it was the quickest uh, and most efficient way to learn how to um, manage a company. And also the, the, I had some very strong learnings about how to face failure. So um, I really fa failed. I mean, uh, the company failed. I was the, the end responsible. There were others that I could think they didn't do th things right, but at the end I was not doing things right also because at the end I was the, the last responsible. And there were um, uh, things to um, consider uh, uh, not to, I mean, um, repeat again in future in case I could survive to that situation. And the truth is that I could survive. Um, um, and I think uh, my, the, main, the main learning was, I mean, when, when things go wrong, um, they can always be worse. So it's, it's very important to, to touch bottom. Uh, you can fall in the abyss or you can simply uh, try to be um, conscious of what's going on. And the first thing is to accept the situation. Um, I would say also a second important step is, is to find the right support. Who are the ones that could still hold you or even not financially, but because really financially uh, there were no, no many opportunities, but at least you can um, find advice on on good people or even some uh, psychological support as well. That at the end, uh, all the support must be inside oneself. But but it's also important to, to and and something that you learn from that that things that happened is who was close to you at that moment, at those moments. And and so also there is also another. Like important step that I stage that is the the fact that we are always a choice. Even in the worst moment, we can always choose. We can all you have always some um, freedom to to define what should be the next step. And this freedom, uh, I can imagine that we are not always 
aware, but even I, in, in the war situation, um, uh, we are always, there is, there is this dignity at the end. No? And, and I, it's my choice how I am going to accept things or how I am going to, to run with this thing. No? And that was something I, that I, sorry. If, if I interrupt you very briefly, you said we always have a choice. So, uh, I, I mean, you must have had a moment where you thought like in this whole uh, bankruptcy process and this very difficult time, you must have had moments where you thought I'll just throw it all down. I'll go on holidays for half a year uh, and then I'll see what happens. But I'm, I've had enough of it. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what, what kept you, you going in this moment where, you know, a fair share of people, uh, and I wouldn't judge that. I think that is a choice you have, is to just, just say like, okay, I'm, I'm going on a long holiday and then we'll see what happens. I'm not going to go through this whole struggle for the next year and a half now. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, I, I had the, the luckiness to find a, a great lawyer. And I, I remember the day we met, he said, look, you have choices I said, yeah, come on choices I, I, what i need is to survive and he said um, yeah of course you can you can choose you could still make the ball bigger you go to the bank you ask for loans you you, you get on there's one choice you you can simply escape you go to somewhere in the caribbean or whatever and you still have money to i mean you can take it from there and you can but i don't recommend you and then you can simply approach it and define how to approach it, uh, define a strategy on how to face it. And that was a choice, defining the strategy. And, and, and the best strategy we, we could define uh, was selling what we call the productive unit. So actually it was mm, the value of this productive unit was peanuts because we we were engineers and working as engineers, we only do consultancy work. So we, we don't have assets, we don't have machines, we don't have uh, factories or things. We, we just have um, uh, what, what we can create from our brains. No? And, and so we together, what he, he suggested, I could find someone who bought this, or even I could try to, to convince the lawyer on me doing it, taking that step. And it's something, I mean, I, it took me a while to decide what, what to do. And talking also with relatives uh, after that period suffering a little bit, we said, okay, let's, let's better look for someone uh, that we can move together in future uh, so that I am not going to be alone, but be part of a, of a corporation. So, and, and I think that, I mean, sometimes when, when things go wrong, but you, you try to do your best, then sometimes there is some luckiness. So we, we could find uh, the urns, that is this Dutch firm, I heard there was a Dutch firm that was looking for a Spanish office to, to open. And so we started conversations and it was, it was not easy, but it was possible. So it happened and, and we could um, agree on, on a sale that was directly for our um, bankruptcy process, so, so to pay staff and debtors and everything, um, and and it was uh, also for me the opportunity to uh, discover another way of working because um, I was what I was most surprised at that stage was the approach that the CFO, the CEO at that stage, made about his company and he was very uh, um, based on currents and the acts that he did, he wanted to be aligned with a number of principles. And, and he was always driven by, by the same principles. 
And I could see also in late, later that when facing difficulties, he tried to be always coherent. And, and that was a, a big inspiration. With time, uh, so when I, when I could um, recover from, from, from my uh, difficult period, I learned about other ways of working. And, you know, I, mean, I was already working differently because of this integration to, to a larger company that had uh, a more oriented to values structure. But then we, uh, well, I, I read that book from Frederick Laloux, Reinventing Organizations, and then met the people from K2K in, in Bilbao that have a lot of experience in what they call the NER style. N-E-R, and, and, and I got inspired about it. And so since, uh, so it was, it's more than three years that I, I made a seminar with them and I started talking with, with what were my bosses about um, this idea of having a different type of structure, a different way of organizing ourselves. Um, that since then we have been on a path to work as um, self-managed teams and based on also in fact on some principles but that principles that are really defined by the staff and that are driving the way we work eh? and we have them um, present in, in our daily work and we try to be coherent with them. And so it's, it's now internally, I'm the coordinator, uh, it's not the, not the director, because we, we try for everyone to be responsible and, and for the hierarchy to be non uh, guided by the structure, but guided by the lead leadership and the experience, leadership skills and the experience of the different people. So it's a flat structure. And, and so like this, we have been experimenting uh, effectively, in fact, for two years. And we will continue experimenting because it's, it's a process with no end and with continuous learning. And, and this is where we are. Very, very interesting. And uh, thanks a lot. Just to add one question to that, you say it's a process, it's a continuous uh, evolution of, of how you uh, organize and, and lead in the company. But how, how do you decide on when changes are necessary and, and how, how, you know, in what direction those changes will, will go? Uh, because if you're saying you are, you know, this is self-management and the, 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 the employees have got a you know, low, low hierarchies, less structures, um, so it can't be you saying we have to uh, we have to change this in that direction now and that's it. So how how who decides how you change in what way? So we we decide by consent. So w wherever um, there is a proposal, uh, you can agree with this, you can say no, or you can say I can live with it. I, or I'm not sure, but I can live with it. If you say no, then very probably it's not going to be approved. Uh, but if you say no, you have to explain why, why you say no. And for instance, uh, we, we had historical uh, discussions or I would say more um, challenges or difficulties. For instance, we have, we have office in Madrid and Barcelona. And and they were doing different parts of the project. And, you know, there is always some uh, tension, not only with the sports, Madrid and Barcelona, but it was like a reflection of that also in, in our office. And then we also had some difficulties because we were divided in business units and some were performing better than others. But it was very complicated to, to have a... Um, so uh, sharing stuff from, from one to the other. And what we did, and that was 
that like the first stage of this change was there is absolutely um, um, no department, no speciality, everything is for everyone. And we have been meeting up until very recently, every Monday, all the staff to discuss about the project. So everybody looking or taking care of, or at least being informed about everything that is going elsewhere in our Spanish office. Um, the things that are the truest is that we have been growing, uh, we are entering into different markets. And I think that this idea that we are uh, together and, and we hold each other, now it's, it's solid. And the next step that has been agreed is that we work in st stable teams. And those stable teams will only meet once a month and we'll share which are their targets or their goals and which are the the results of the previous month so there is a, a process of of evolving that is always agreed under consent now you you say that basically uh, you know if, if one person has good reasons to not want something chances are that that will you know, stop the whole process and that it, it, it won't be done uh, in the way it was initially suggested. So, uh, you know, with a traditional hierarchical organizational mindset, things like that, you would just say like, this is so terribly inefficient. Uh, it's a nice dream. Maybe you're a lucky single organization that somehow by magic makes it work, uh, but you gotta be barely surviving economically. This cannot be good business. Um, what were what were the business results you have achieved on a on a you know the financial hard side of the business uh, since you've implemented these management uh, techniques these new approaches to organizing uh, teams and and your work basically? Yeah, um, really, the, um, uh, there there are some assumptions that is spending so much time on on alignment or or. Uh, um, just understanding which are all the views uh, that the staff has for a certain topic, uh, it's losing time. And, and I can totally understand <laughs> those, 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 um, those arguments. But uh, what is true is that uh, it allows for um, like a stronger commitment from everyone. So, because if we, take a decision because we took it together, even if it is not the best decision, because decisions are not always perfect, it will allow for at least um, people trying to take the best of this solution and suggesting maybe how to address it. It's different if it is um, something that the director decides and in a way has to sell to the rest of the staff. No? That, and then the staff can buy or not, or can say they buy, but then they do what they want. But it's, it's very different if, if, if we uh, decided together, even though it can take a little bit longer, uh, the challenge is how, how to not to be too long time no, with this discussion. And, and this is also a learning. But in our case, uh, all this process uh, last year brought to, to us substantial increase on, on our result. Uh, we multiplied actually by eight uh, compared to the previous year, comparing apples with apples, uh, our EBIT. Mm. So uh, this I, year, I, sorry, I have to interrupt you there. Yeah. By eight times. Yes, by eight times, yes, yes. With, with nearly the same revenue. Mm. Okay, so um, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think that can be labeled a, a commercial success. Yes, of course. <laughs> Of course, and that was not the main target, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that this is a this is an outcome on 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 how things are done. And this year, in terms of uh, percentage of result, is is not going as good. And this is why also we we have done these these um, ch changes. But the truth is that we are having a, a a very fast growth and and entering onto different markets. And so we need to adjust it. So we are 
uh, for us is it's quite a lot growing 20 to 25 percent uh, because they are always projects that are um, that need, need a lot of attention and and so we we are growing fast something that we didn't do last year and now i am confident and this is a discussion we have had that we we will i mean in terms of of result it's going to be um something at least very similar to last year and yes at the end i mean um my learning is also that uh so if you if you just want result uh, you can have it but what is interesting is is the long term and if you have want a long term result you need to uh, invest on 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 what can bring it and in our case is is our staff and because we only have staff as i said we don't have machines or we don't have um assets that we buy and we sell and 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 that's that's the outcome eh? but it's it's an outcome um there is this sentence of someone that was saying that um we need profit because it's like the air we we breathe no? we, we need it to lie to live but we don't live to breathe yes that is a profit uh... Yes, and I think uh, nails it, and, and you beautifully said that. Um, uh, yes, it was a huge success commercially, but that was not the aim. That was not the goal. And uh, yes, the, the, the breathing the air example is good. Uh, I like also the example that if you imagine a football game where one trainer tells the, the team to permanently look at the scoreboard, uh, you know, have one eye on the ball and the other eye on the scoreboard. And yeah. the other trainer tells the team to have both eyes on the ball and play a beautiful game. Uh, you know, who, who is going to play the better football? Who's more likely to win? If you permanently look at the scoreboard, you don't look at the ball. Uh, and to play well and uh, to play successfully, you need to look at the ball and not at the scoreboard. And the score will hopefully it will come then. It's no guarantee, but, uh, but hopefully the, the score will come. And in your case, uh, it came, which is which is beautiful, and, uh, and co congratulations on that. Uh, now I, I want to move on a little bit in our in our discussion because part of this, uh, you know, setting for leadership gold is to reflect uh, experiences from practitioners, from people like you who lead uh, and uh, uh, and are in in, uh, in 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 sort of the driving seat of of business organizations to reflect jointly with them on, on our um, three steps or three main pillars of humanistic management. And, and the first one being the unconditional respect for the dignity of life. And um, I, I think you mentioned LALU and uh, reinventing organizations. And I think uh, there's, uh, um, you know, uh, empirical evidence out there why people leave their job. It's because their bosses uh, are, are not, uh, they don't like their boss, basically. That's what makes people leave mostly um, their job. There are a lot of people that don't feel respected. A lot of studies, when you look at why people um, go on strikes, why they march uh, on the streets, it's not because they want more money. It's because they want to be treated and respected in a humane uh, and, and decent way. And so all of these questions um, on, on dignity in daily operations and on respecting dignity in daily operations, um, what is your experience there? Is that something that you have any you know, sentiment towards? Is that something where employees and uh, members of your organization gave feedback on? Um, how do you respect dignity at, at Dance in Spain? Um. I would say we, we try to, <laughs> humbly, I would say. Um, I think, I mean, we, we defined those values that we want them to, to run the way we operate. And maybe I could share some of them, for instance. Um, if you want to work with us, uh, you have the freedom to do what you want, what you want, and when you want. Uh, you need to commit to something and you will get as much freedom as responsibility you can take. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. Then the other is transparency. We, we are 
um, very transparent uh, in terms of um, payrolls or, or the, um, uh, the project results, the, the performance of, 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 of the projects or the, of the staff. Um, the, the, but this transparency, we understand that brings trust. So if there is no hidden agenda, then you can, then there is a way of trusting because you know what's going on. You could trust on some politicians because they tell you nice things, but maybe you don't know what, what they are going to do or you, you don't have a clear understanding. Uh, but you could also trust people that tell things that can demonstrate that, 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 that are touchable, that, that you can have uh, this transparency. So we, we think that trust is related with this transparency. And then when, when we have this trust is when we can bring uh, the, the level of commitment that can make things different. And I will be honest, I mean, we, we don't always get it. Uh, uh, projects are difficult, uh, clients are difficult, and, and, and sometimes things go better than others. But I think we have seen that if we all go in the same direction with, with this information, with this clarity on, on, on what are the data, and, and we trust each other, and then, I mean, we can do anything with the highest result. And so these, these are values that I think are uh, in our DNA, and I know what you think, but I think I related with with dignity at the end. And so, also, what is very important is that your view your view counts. So we we want to hear your view, and we also promote that people express themselves in public. We prefer uh, to have open discussions in public, even inconvenient conversations. Uh, more than one-to-one -one and trying to understand what's going on just from single pieces. And also, um, I think that, as I was saying, we, we take steps with this method of um, consent, um, but uh, sometimes we don't take uh, the right decision or, or we jump onto situations that we are not completely prepared. So we need to have this mindset to be ready to, to react, to, to do things differently and understanding that sometimes it's inconvenient, but we will find a way. Uh, yeah. and I mean, I, I relate very well, I think, because a lot of it touches the, uh, you know, the, the fundamental um, uh, insight or acceptance that we as humans have intrinsic value. Right, and that we are exactly. on, but that we are not just instrumental to whatever uh, an organization wants to achieve. So uh, the self-commitment element has a strong dimension of, of respect. Um, the voicing your concerns and being encouraged to talk up, to speak up, and to uh, to say what uh, what you uh, what you think or or feel uh, in in given situations. Uh, transparency, of course, is a sign of saying. Um, you, you have a right to know what's going on in this organization. And this right is bigger than the necessity to have access to specific information for your role, for your function, right? So uh, I think all of those things relate, uh, relate strongly and, and make it uh, interesting uh, to, to see the practical side of it. How do you, what are dimensions that, uh, that are integrating a respectful uh, environment uh, at, at work, basically. And uh, I mean, one, one small question would be how many people have left uh, your organization in the last two years? How many what? Sorry? Have left, have resigned, have gone to another place because they didn't really want to stay with you. Um, well, there, there is people that has left. Uh, I would say maybe six people, something like this, the last two, three years. Okay. And there were people that left because they didn't feel comfortable with, with this way of working. There is people, I mean, 
And I, I don't want to say that this is the best way of working. This is the way of working that I like and I, that, that I think uh, that I know that works best for me. But there is more traditional ways of working that for certain people are more appropriate. Mm -hmm. And okay. and so uh, I've had long uh, discussions before, and I think it's an interesting point where you uh, can say, you know, that some people maybe they just want to go to some place they call work, and then they do something for eight hours, which is very narrowly defined, uh, which they uh, uh, you know adopt as their role. And then they want to go home and their life is outside. Their life is what they do with their family, what they do with their friends, the hobbies they have. And they don't want to commit and engage and self-manage and speak up and team this and, and collaborate here. Uh, they don't want that. Uh, is it, it's, I, I still don't know whether that is a, a legitimate choice for someone or whether this is just, uh, you know, it would be arrogant to say they just haven't reflected enough uh, to uh, so if they're thinking like that. So I, I, for me, it's still very inconclusive what I should think about this this approach. But it does exist, right? There are people who are saying who are saying that uh, their life is outside of work, and in work they don't want all this uh, self management stuff. Yes, clearly. I mean, if you if you have this mindset, then this kind of organization uh, you want to be that comfortable. Probably, uh, even though it could still work, but, but uh, the fit is not obvious. And then uh, there is people that um, could eventually prefer to have a card with a description of a position that is, I'm director of this or that, and I'm the boss of uh, 30 or, or 20 or whatever uh, number of people and and that we cannot offer because this is not what we think uh, we, the, what we want hmm? so there is people that are more if you let me more old school minded uh, that would not uh, like an organization based on self-managed teams Good. Um, uh, I'm looking at the time a little. So um, uh, what I'm saying right now, at least, is already to encourage all of you to uh, pick up questions because we will uh, take time for a Q&A. Uh, and you can either put it in the chat or once we're, uh, we're opening the Q&A, you can also raise your hand and then we can unmute you uh, so that you can uh, raise your question uh, directly. But I just want to announce that as we go along a little further in, in the conversation with Mikael, that you're, you're aware that your questions will be heard and that we want uh, to get them coming in, either in the chat, uh, I see Carlos already has written one, um, or um, uh, you raise your hand and then you can uh, uh, raise your question directly. Um, if we're looking at uh, the, the, the dignity, I think you've, you've framed it interestingly and, and provided us with some very practical insights of how that uh, can be put to life uh, in the organization. Um, the, the second part on, on humanistic management is the integration of ethical questions and management decisions, right? Where we're saying basically um, it's, a, it's a more robust way of running an organization. In the long term, it is also a commercially better way to run an organization than to build things uh, with a one-dimensional goal set, uh, short-term profit, and then you build it in a way you know it will break at some point. And then when it breaks, you have to spend a lot of money, resources, uh, public relationship efforts, and so forth. Uh, to fix it again. Why don't you build it in a way it doesn't break so easily? Uh, in the first place is the main um, sort of driver and the main rationale for saying we need to integrate ethical questions more strongly in management decisions. On the other hand, this sometimes means walking away from business. This sometimes can mean, uh, you know, this might be interesting and, and good in a, you know, for, for our results in this quarter, uh, but we don't think it's the right thing to do. We're not going to do that. Uh, are there any experiences like that that you have had where you said, uh, you know, we, we, I'm not comfortable doing it the way it is proposed here. This is not the way we want to do business. Or how, how does this integration of ethical questions uh, play into your, your daily operations? Yes. Uh, 
Well, maybe maybe a first reflection is that um, a system like this, uh, what needs is to be very coherent. So you cannot agree on a way of working or or um, values driving your activity and doing some exceptions. You can easily uh, um, turn everything wrong if if you if you lose this coherence. And so what what is important maybe and, and bring us some strength in this ethical reflections, I would say is, is the fact that everyone view uh, is, is taking into place. No? And so sometimes we have deep discussions about ethical aspects uh, that maybe don't bring anywhere, but uh, let us at least um, understand what would be good that we do or wouldn't be that good. For instance, we had discussions about if we would like to, to work on projects related with army, now that there is the war, and what would be the, the, the limit, anything, or could still we do a data center? We do data centers, for instance, or something like this. Or we do airports, but airports have planes that pollute. No? And so we and, and we are very oriented to environmental aspects and very very strong on, and also the way we uh, present ourselves to the to the market uh, that that we are consultants on sustainability, that we want to be carbon neutral ourselves, and we assess our clients to to become as well. Uh, so these are discussions that we that we have, uh, and also. When we do this consultancy on environmental, what is really deep and right, and or, or what is greenwashing only? That there is a lot of greenwashing with environmental, and you can feel proud because I, I bought that thing that is recycled, but then you go uh, with your I don't know. Eh? Uh, so this current is not easy, uh, but I think that is like the the word that I would use to. To define how we approach the ethical aspects, and and also I would like to mention. I mean, I we are just the Spanish office of of a of a group of an international company, and what I I think it's it's interesting is even though the rest of the group doesn't work like us with the self managed teams, they they are um, like respecting and. Uh, also um, accompanying us. And so they, they support us on our process, even though the group, for instance, has changed the CEO. Now we have a new CEO and a new structure in place, a structure that group-wise makes complete sense because we are specialized in niches. And so in, in some markets uh, that if you are a specialist in this market, it's better to integrate all, all the resources, all the capacity that is in the different uh, countries. So we have, instead of a, a, a company-oriented uh, group organization, it's now per segments. So uh, we, for instance, in Spain, should be now part of two different divisions. One more high tech and the other more with real estate. And discussing with with our with my bosses in 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 the group, they agreed that we need more time. That we will continue being one team. That is what brand brought us these good results and also this um, engagement with with the staff. And so that very strong team that we have, we, we cannot split in two. But we are finding the way to to have this double PNL, but also becoming a team. And that we have a couple of years to, to manage. And for me, this is also ethical to how, how, how you can adapt uh, your, um, uh, your ambitions, your strategy to the conditions that are in the different places with the different people. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it goes both ways, right? I mean, uh, you, the, the headquarters could say, you know, we're, we're sorry, Mika, we're reorganizing. This is how we do it now. You know, that's it, <laughs> right? And yes. you could also uh, say to your team, you know, sorry, guys, uh, we, we tried, but it, it is no longer compatible uh, with how the organization is operating globally. Um, uh, but you're, you're both um, uh, headquarters as well as you are, are saying like, you know, this is an opportunity. Let's, let's try and see how we can make it work that we maintain uh, our ways of doing things and uh, without, uh, and, and finding ways to be compatible uh, uh, or being able to dock onto the, the, the rest of the organization. Right? Absolutely, it's two ways, yes. Very good. Um, this is getting hard because uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time and questions are coming in, which is great. So uh, let me just uh, see if we can cover quickly one part that we also talked uh, about before, which is the whole question of stakeholder engagement, where in, in humanistic management, we're really saying uh, that is an instrument, a tool you have to bring the rubber on the road and uh, to see um, how you impact uh, external stakeholders, business partners, civil society organizations, also your employees, of course, which we have already covered. Uh, but how, how are you acting or interacting, uh, to say it better, uh, with, uh, with your stakeholders at, at Dance in Spain? Yeah. Um, maybe what is, could be interesting to say is, is how we see the construction sector and, and what we are proposing. Um, in Spain, we have a traditional way of, of working so that there is a first stage where there is a team that does the design, the design team. Then there is a tender for contractors, and then there is an execution that is on the contractor side. Uh, it does, does the construction of any of the projects we do. If we do projects, it could be offices or hotels or data centers, laboratories or airports, anything. Uh, or hospitals. So um, normally there is like di very different interests. The designer, the developer, the contractor, uh, then maybe the other consultants. No? It could be a health and safety consultant or, or other designers. And also the, within the designers, there could be the interest of the engineer and the architect. Sometimes there could be challenges. And the the, the the proposal we are doing, and we are collaborating with, with some clients on this, is uh, related, actually, it comes out of, of the way we work. Eh? So uh, it's just to um, not go to a design and build, that could be an option, but then, uh, so design and build means there is a contractor that hires the design team, so it's under the contractor, you have to design, so the designer will be aligned with the contractor because he has no choice, it's his client. But sometimes it could challenge the quality of the end product or not the best value for money. So what we, what we are suggesting is the, um, like a collaborative project, we call it. And, and so we have a number of stakeholders within a project with all the design team, the, the developer, uh, maybe uh, there could be an end client also, or, or, or maybe even the, uh, because we work also with projects that there is a developer and then an, a fund buying the project when completed. Uh, so di different stakeholders and, and the contractor as well. And the idea is to, to, uh, to agree on goals for the project and share those goals. And those goals must be beyond everyone interest. So we need to achieve these quality levels, this level of innovation, this uh, costs and this program, this timing. And with, with all this, we, we define a methodology that we want to have everybody engaged during all project line. If you lose engagement, then, th in every phase, you could step out. So it, it is a review of engagement. Or step out or uh, it needs to be reviewed. But it's, it's an effort to, to soften those divisions that 
uh, at the end bring an inefficiency in the process. And I think um, this is a way to engage with stakeholders uh, that is needed, um, at least in our sector, maybe in others as well. And, and there are already um, some examples uh, that at the end, of course, everything needs to be, we need to learn, uh, but I think they are already more interesting than the traditional way of working. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, stakeholder engagement is more than uh, sitting down for a coffee with a uh, environmental NGO and uh, telling them about all the uh, great uh, environmental protection uh, yes. initiatives that you're supporting as a business. Um, so I think this is a very interesting example because in, this, in essence, I mean, uh, uh, some of your clients are, are public and then we have a very clear case of, of uh, you know, uh, saving public money by having this more collaborative approach and not having these uh, this this systemic setup where where different interests collide and, and everyone is looking uh, after uh, conflicting uh, aims basically and so uh, so so yes the, the outcome and the stakeholder benefits the societal benefits uh, seem to be very clear and uh, and I, I wish you a lot of success with that because it seems uh, always. Um, a pity when when value is lost because you have setups where uh, where interests are not aligned. And uh, if you can work towards that, uh, the environment will benefit. The the, the tax paying public will benefit. Uh, the happiness of the people involved, like probably, is going to benefit from it. Uh, and in the end, um, uh, it's it's a good and right thing to do. So a very nice example, I think, for a productive stakeholder engagement that goes beyond, as I said, what we often think is, uh, you know, in inviting uh, to roundtables with civil society organizations and then uh, businesses present all the good stuff they do. That is interesting and nice, and I think that that should be done. Um, and it should be put under scrutiny, of course, from the from the presence of the society organizations. But it's not the only way to frame and to uh, uh, and live um, uh, stakeholder engagement. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mikael. Um, I'm doing something that is very hard for me now, um, but uh, I'll uh, bring back um, uh, Ivan, who um, has uh, looked at uh, some questions. I think that were in the chat already. And um, so we're, we're moving over to the, the Q&A now. All right. So thanks. Thanks a lot for this very insightful conversation between uh, you, Mikael, and, and Ernst. It's been very, very interesting. And they have been already uh, arousing some interest in the, in the audience. And I can see here uh, some questions that I can read um, in chronological order. And one of the first ones is been done by Carlos Larchaga Martinez, and he's asking the people that left. You mentioned that some some six uh, employees left. Um, do they say what they were more uncomfortable with uh, with the new self management style? Which which were, were, were the main things that they disagreed upon, or why were they feeling uncomfortable with this? Did they explicitly manifest their their disagreement or something like that? Um, yeah, I think I think uh, we already mentioned it a bit. Um, yeah, I, th I think there is there is um, people that don't feel that comfortable with an organization that requires your um, initiative, your engagement, and also uh, that on a way you are not allocated within a large organizational chart with people above, people below, um, a bit below, and so that you report to this. And, and, and it's also, I mean, I think it's also a cultural thing. So it depends on, on whom is more or less comfortable with, with this type of organization. Thanks a lot, Mikel. There is another question. This has been raised by Paroma Singupta. And of course, uh, she's referring to the difficulties this type of uh, leadership, uh, the introduction of this new leadership could entail for, for employees. So um, one can have this big idea of, okay, I like this leadership style. I'm going to, to introduce it. I'm going to try to implement it. But did you uh, prepare 
is to, to, to work in this style? Did you brief them? Did you share within some questions or, or, or insights uh, saying them, okay, I'm gonna go this direction. This is the, the main roadmap I, ha I, I have. I wanna share this with you. Did you prepare the, the, the terrain for the, for the people to follow you? Yes, we, we, uh, we have been working with, uh, with the support of, of some coaches, especially at the beginning, uh, that helped us in, a, in the soft skills aspects and also to, to get the, the, the feedback of, of how things were going on. Um, it's a process that, of course, I mean, the, 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 when you present it, uh, people approve it by consent, but they are not perfectly aware of, of what we're talking about. And it's uh, so that they discover meanwhile. And what I can say is that um, it's, it needs to go smooth, it, it, needs, it needs to grow, and it's for the people to define where do we want to arrive and how we want to do things. And I think also the support of, of, of specialist coaches, and now we are with other, with more with mediators, uh, we are starting, uh, because we see that uh, in order to have these uh, difficult conversations, uh, it's very important to, to work on, on the way we communicate, eh? uh, the language we use. And so it's very important that it's not only about the process, how are we going to organize these self-managed teams and what will be the KPIs and what will, so it, it's about the whole approach eh? and, the, and, the, and the staff needs uh, an understanding and uh, so um, um, so that, that, that they they get the support in all aspects to to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's and, interesting. And, yeah, sorry, sorry. and honestly, uh, I mean, we do it the best way we can, and we know there is still a lot to improve. But yeah. we are uh, we, we want to be. Um, as close to, to the people as possible. Yeah, so once you start working, you know when you have to launch the first step, but you don't, you don't know exactly where you are going to get. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you've mentioned this, uh, this model, K2K, NER, uh, Emocionando, uh, which is yeah. it's a thrilling people, uh, trying to create this commitment for people to understand the sensor or, uh, and purpose of the, of the actions uh, they do, and I, I think this is, is fabulous, especially when we talk about the the inventor of this of this method, Koldo Sarachaga, which was of the um, of the guys coming out from this uh, Mondragon Corporation. Correct. Yeah. And he was in charge of yeah, trying to uh, save companies from bankruptcy, and he, and he has been challenging this very hierarchical system that was very traditional in in, in companies and. Yeah, you need to have this the, con the consent. Uh, you have to create a narrative uh, upon which everybody believes and and, and rows in the same direction. Um, and once people embark in this uh, boat, and once they start rowing in the same direction, um, things change. Things happen. You have to readapt constantly, perhaps. And um, in that sense, in this model, you have been explaining. Uh, how do you plan the career growth for your staff? This is a question raised by Margaret Isabor. How do you plan the career growth of, of, for your staff? Yeah, we, we try to have these this close um, conversations to understand where, where, where do they want to, to work in? Uh, what is their, uh, their wish for, for, for future and where, where they feel more uh, triggered or motivated to, to develop. And, and we, we always have the principle that uh, we, we need to have the, a system that allows for this to happen when, when the organization can provide this. So 
if I want to do something completely different to what I am doing, maybe we don't have this this space now, but uh, we want to have this awareness and um, and keep it in mind so that uh, whenever this will happen, uh, the change will will take place. And at the same time, uh, people can suggest if they want a training or they want to specialize in something interesting for, for their field. And we, for us, it's very important also the innovation part. Uh, we have a team dedicated to this. And, and like this, you, you can uh, join teams that work on, on this innovation side. And the truth is that uh, so we have we have the ideas, but we have still not figured out how how to really finance it. And we are in going to have a, also discussions with the group uh, how to figure out all, all these initiatives that are related with innovation. Um, because also we have always we are always uh, pushed by, by clients. No, we, we are always on a rush. And innovation needs time and needs patience. Yeah. So it's it's a balance. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, Mikel. There is another question that was raised by Jakub Vitra, and he was asking um, how many people are working in the company right now. And I will ask and add to this question: Once you have started uh, three years ago implementing this new, this new leadership style, now you are growing. Uh, are you recruiting more people? And if so, is your new leadership model or is, is making your company more attractive for those who are uh, seeking for a job? Are you creating a certain culture within your sector where you could become more attractive as a company by the way you are doing things? Yes. Um, so we are, uh, I think when we started, uh, we were 32. Now we are 51, something like this. So there's some growth. This is Spain, uh, the group. It's between 550, 600. So it's, it's still a small company, maybe yeah. for, for some of you, or medium company. Yeah. Uh, but we actually, we subcontract a lot of work. So together, maybe we are close to 70, 80 people yeah, because we have. Um, and so with some people, yes, we are very attractive. So some new hires come uh, because of the way we we propose, and actually we have some challenges. For instance, the the job market now the salaries have been increasing a lot even before uh, this last uh, inflation months, and and sometimes since we have everything transparent, if you join a position, there is a salary for that position. So maybe the market we found out that there were at least not for people within the existing comp uh, the existing positions, but if you were moving, there was a chance to increase your salary. And, and so there were people that were, have been joining, even though we were not offering the best price uh, in the market, no? that, but they liked the proposal. Mm -hmm. And what I'm sure also is there is a lot of staff that have been receiving Loads of very nice um, round proposals, uh, and that have been um, staying with us. So you are working more on the values, right, than a monetary compensation that many others in, out in the market could offer to. Yeah, at the end, I mean, there is a limit with with the financial, especially. I mean, you, you, this world is every day a little bit more crazy. Looks like, so you cannot. Uh, enter into this spiral of of, of salaries, mm -hmm. even though we, we try to be uh, at the higher band. No? So we, we prefer to to have the staff uh, with with a nice salary, but of course there is an emotional salary that maybe is is more important. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks a lot. And there is another question which is related to the things we have been discussing so far, but Firdus Arjun. Um, which were the main challenges you may think could arise in the future? Uh, what's your preparation for, to face those challenges, to overcome those problems? As you go, you're going to face 
more problems, all the things have to adjust every day. Um, probably you have done already some planning or visualization of how the, the future is gonna look like, especially with the pieces that you're posting, putting in the puzzle. Uh, so which are the main hurdles you, you may identify in the, in the short time, medium, long um, term? I think, I think clearly for the business, clearly is, is the exterior, what can happen outside. Hmm? If, if at the sectors uh, we work in are, are going to keep on investing because at the end we depend on investment and, and clearly uh, there is a risk there. So the way we face uh, these difficulties is, is how, how do we respond to it? It's gonna be the challenge no? if, if, it, if it is the case. So we have a principle that uh, due to financial reasons, we don't want to, um, to lay off staff. Um, and, and this, of course, the group can support, but all, only till central level, probably, if, if, the, if the problems become large. Then there is probably an effort uh, to be done by the rest, or we need to restructure or do type of works that we wouldn't do. But at the end, the only way to, to respond to these questions will be with the same idea, no? Mm -hmm. Being transparent, uh, so um, trying to get this trust on together we can do it and, and with, with a strong commitment, uh, try to uh, find solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that an organization like this is much more robust mm, than an, an organization that when things start to go well, don't, not so good, start doing lays off. Um, and it's completely contradictory because now it's complicated to, to hire, then it's complicated to, um, then, then you, you're going to lay off. That, that would be crazy. No? And so I think, uh, Again, the currents is the only, the only option for the challenges and for this crazy world that we're in. Of course, at, at the end of the day, this coherence and this transparency are the reference point that you have to uh, embrace in order to, to be sustainable in this uh, vulnerable and yeah. good world. So they, at least you are providing certain solid framework in which you are working. Uh, yeah. It's going to guide your, your action and the way you are going to steer your company across different contexts. Um, there is another and, linked. And sorry, sorry, say again. No, and you you can say that because of it, then we are much more robust. Yeah. With this approach. Yeah. And you've mentioned this trust, uh, which is this uh, point of reference that is very much needed, especially in in in, in our days and. Yeah, it's, 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 it's linked also to, at, at, at the leadership level, how, you, how do you embody the values you're preaching? Because of course, if there is a, a lack of alignment between what you are preaching or pretend from others, uh, when, with the things you say or you do, of course, that's the, the, the castle is gonna crumble down. It's not going to, it's not going to be sustainable. And yeah. so a, a, another question um, from uh, Giuseppe Ugazio, and he's, uh, touching up on the question of sustainability and profit, and he's uh, writing, while profit is the air, the oxygen you need, how do you determine when to limit or stop growth to ensure you can be sustainable? And in the short middle term, how do you compete with those who don't care about being sustainable? We've been talking about greenwashing and these things. So what, what's your, your, your point on this, please? It's interesting because these are discussions that we have had. <laughs> So, and, and, and what I like, in fact, I mean, I have my own view, but I, I learned that the view of the, of the team is always, or is, is, is very like robust. No? So we, we said, why growing? So we grow just uh, to be able to bring a better response and to be also, uh, more robust because we we can uh, enter into different markets. So when the challenges come, uh, you have uh, different uh, places where you put the different decks. Mm -hmm. um, 
so and I fully agree. Uh, we need to to be very conscious not to grow too quickly, eh? um, and sustainability is related with this. I fully agree, and um, and so we we have a team that is more related with sales than the ones that work on. So we have the self-managed teams and the client service team. And there is always a tension because the client service teams wants to achieve some goals and the self-managed team says, why? Then we always have this discussion. Uh, what is the value of this new project we were not prepared to do? Do we want to take it or not? And it's very important to have the chance to say no. And, and, and so uh, this, this has happened. Um, so the other question was, uh, those that are not being sustainable. Uh, yeah, well, the truth is that in our sector, uh, I mean, not being sustainable is, I would say, not, not about the, the greenwashing, that is true. I mean, uh, we can be more expensive than companies uh, than just go for certain labels, get, uh, uh, but, but not on the value of, of an assessment. Uh, that, um, but what is really not being su um, sustainable for me is, is when we compete uh, with, with those prices that that, they, uh, that lose the value of, of, um, of, of the advice no? or, or the consultancy that we do. And, and then it's in those markets when it happens is when we have to step back. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, there is another question and it refers to, you have been working uh, within this new leadership style of, of the last three, three years in a conversation we had uh, two days ago, uh, you said that at least to start seeing the first results, you have to wait a couple of years or so. But once you have started to develop a certain narrative, people start uh, flapping the, the, the ears and say, okay, I, I'm attracted by this discourse, by this narrative, and things start happening spontaneously, which is the, the interesting thing. So one, one thing is what you have planned uh, to do, uh, what is happening with the consultants, implementing this type of leadership style and then to wait how the others react to this to this narrative. Um, after these three years uh, and, 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 and being aware of the knowledge you have accumulated over this period of time, which are the main things you have done and uh, you will have done differently uh, after that? This is a question uh, which is being posed by Sumia Sukla. Um. Honestly, I don't know what I would have done differently, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe my learnings are especially related with the fact of um, promoting uh, that this knowledge that uh, is there and that people sometimes don't express uh, to flourish. So uh, promoting these discussions uh, that uh, we could normally avoid, but whenever there is a decision that is key to be taken, so take the energy to have the, the right discussion. And then also promoting this mindset of, uh, and, and the awareness of this mindset, because I mean, um, sometimes the problem is that it's not that clear, no? but the mindset of uh, what we are going to do won't be perfect. We must give it a try to then correct and improve it. And, and maybe at the beginning it was not that clear and we tried to make it perfect and it was very difficult. So this is, this is something that is also- Thanks a lot. I have another, another question and we are approaching more or less to the end, I believe, uh, before the, 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 the last part of this, um, uh, session with the uh, musician Ayrton Prato. Um, I have uh, read elsewhere that uh, Harvard University published a research few few days or weeks ago where they were saying that the 80 percent 
of the promotion of, of the professional promotions in the world ha, uh, uh, are due to attitudes and behavior, not to technical competencies. While the 15% are due to these technical competencies, and that, that, that's an interesting finding because when we are talking about education, we are mostly focusing on technical aspects rather than training people how to better behave and to have a better attitude in general to the to the work, to their role in society and, and in their job post. So in this sense, you've mentioned soft skills. And this is a question that um, Tapa Pramila from Nepal has asked. You've mentioned soft skills to boost engagement. According to you, which are the main soft or the best soft skills that they can boost to uh, reach or to, 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 to improve the engagement, which are the, the element you, you, you will share with us? Hmm. It's a good question. <laughs> hmm. I think uh, in our case, um, um, the soft skills come from a place of um, um, listening. So people need to um, get an awareness of how things are going and uh, look at the, what's going on within the organization, within the staff and outside the organization. And, and from there, uh, see that the, this process that we are offering, so uh, that we believe in in transparency, we believe in diversity, and so that um, everyone uh, brings different things, and uh, the one that is quicker uh, is not better than the one that is slow, slower, but. Uh, provides because he will provide different things and and so it's it's about understanding the whole proposal that I think that can bring uh, engagement and this is only done with with this I think ability to 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 listen to um, to um, open your your mind. And what we do, in fact, is uh, basically um, um, try to, to be as, as clear as and, and, and transparent as, as, as we can and open up the discussions. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, so I don't know if I answered the question, but I like <laughs> <Yeah>. the question. <laughs> There is a lot of um, food, for, food, food for thought and thing. there are a lot of questions that are being raised. Uh, I think that we could, could continue this discussion for, for, for many hours. Um, and it's interesting to see how many of, or most of time when we are talking about the implementation of these different ways of understanding organization, it comes out from crisis or from a situation which is very difficult to, to, to handle, uh, especially in our days when we are living this crisis and turmoil and, and wars and, and viruses and, and, and so on and so forth, it seems that there is more eco, more resonance and people are more um, attentive to, to try to understand these alternative ways of understanding organizations. Uh, and, and I'm as, always asking myself, if, I mean, why should, should we wait for crisis and yeah. oil? to develop or to implement this um, humanistic approach uh, to business, to society, which is the, 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 the mislink of what we, we are meeting. I mean, why are we so much pushed to react once it's perhaps too late? Mm -hmm. a, a way of investing uh, in good times for creating or to having more, I don't know, a, a energy to deal with the future in a different way, more inclusive more with more dignity with more yeah what do you think about this why, why, why human beings are always pushed against the corner and then once it's cornered it starts to to fight back 
I don't know. Uh, I don't know why. Um, I mean, maybe it's it's human condition. <laughs> but I remember when we started with with Koldo Sarachaga that you mentioned and Oscar from K2K, they were saying, um, you have some advantages compared to other companies. You are in financial, financially well, you, you, are, you are not struggling with financial conditions and you have a good uh, environmental um, climate. Eh? So people are not, so it will help us do much more things and, and, and do the, these things quicker than if we were in a situation with, with a company that is uh, close to bankruptcy or, or with, with many egos fighting. And, and yes, so you are absolutely right. Uh, it could be much easier if we had this awareness of what can be done better yeah and I, and I think this is a, a question which is linked to uh, the question uh, posed by ken uh, nishikawa when I mean, he was asking do you believe that business can become an agent for changing society and, course, absolutely yeah yeah I, I this is in fact my my dream no? that that we can plant some seeds and and actually i see it with some of our staff members that they really are ambassadors of a different understanding of how an organization can, can work. Mm -hmm. And from organizations, I think that we can really have an impact and, 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 the, and the change is needed more maybe than ever. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that, I mean, makes me full of energy thinking and seeing those stuff that are in many aspects more evolved than me now mm -hmm. yeah. in, in this type of ideas. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. I mean, again, I, I would love to keep on discussing with <laughs> a lot of hours and, and, and with the people in the audience today, we might have more opportunity in the future. And you have mentioned that one of the most important soft skills that could be or should be boosted are listening and we have a musician in the room. So I think that uh, now could be uh, the moment when uh, we wrap up and thank everybody for uh, joining in today for this wonderful discussion with you, uh, Mikel. And I'm sure that uh, at least at my desire, I would love to keep in contact with you to develop more thinking about this. Um, Ernst, do you want to say a couple of, of words to sure. the audience and Sure. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you. It is the, the first and most important thing I have to say to all of you who participated and, of course, to our speakers. Um, uh, Miguel, um, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I like the last answer. I would add to that. It's not only that business can be an agent of positive change. I think we uh, business has to become an agent for positive change. I mean, how are we going to address uh, the, the challenges we face as a global community without an active contribution of all the creativity, all the innovation, all the energy and dynamic that businesses bring to our, our, our societies, uh, we, we have to uh, get into a situation where businesses actually become uh, an agent for positive change because uh, it will be very, very hard to do it without them. And, and we have some pretty big challenges that, that we need to address. Uh, so, Michael, you're, you're leading the way in so many ways. Uh, also in this, in, in making uh, your organization an agent for positive change. Uh, thank you also for that. Uh, thank you for Kaylee. You uh, have seen her um, on the screen uh, once in a while highlighted our graphic recorder for this session. Uh, so you will receive um, uh, an email, all the registered participants, and it will also be on our social media uh, with a recording, a short version of the recording of this session. And also, of course, the, the graphic recording that, that you have seen uh, popping up on the, on the screen whilst uh, we had this conversation.